Hi all. We our today's speaker is Johnny. Hi guys. It's, it's a consultant uh -huh. from Involved Company and Anna Risina, independent software developer. Anna. Hello. Uh, Johnny, uh, could you could you explain what uh, about your talk? Could you a little describe what about yes, it? Yes, yes, of course. Good afternoon. Very happy to be here. Um, so today and a little bit tomorrow, I will talk about uh, building cloud native applications with .NET five and uh, and Docker containers and Azure Kubernetes service. Um, yeah. So basically, today finally we have programming languages, we have tools like .NET, .NET 5, where we can create flexible applications that we can use in the cloud, um, being cloud native, um, so they are ready to be used in whatever cloud we want. We can, we can put them in Azure cloud or AWS cloud or Google cloud, it doesn't really matter. We can build our applications without really needing to know where we are going to do deploy them thanks to technologies like uh, Docker containers and uh, Kubernetes. Um, these are just a couple of examples of technologies and I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about Docker containers and Azure Kubernetes service, which is basically an implementation of Kubernetes for Azure Cloud. But that doesn't mean that we are only restricted to using Azure. Uh, when we create containers and we, when we are thinking about Kubernetes, we can easily also use another cloud, uh, cloud environment to deploy our uh, containers. But for today, we will use Azure Kubernetes service. Sounds very interesting. Uh, looks like Kubernetes is a very modern technology which allow, uh, which allow uh, scale your application or move between cloud providers. Yes, exactly. And I, I'm, I'm very happy with the ease. Uh, so it's very easy to deploy your containers into uh, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and you can do all kinds of crazy things like you can scale, you can have multiple replicas of the same application that you have automatic load balancing. Um, you can automatically configure your services that they will be killed if they, if they eat too many resources and then be restarted again to make sure your application always stays stable and easy to use. Yes, you you don't like uh, somebody could mine Bitcoin in your application. <laughs> on yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Do you have any specifics about uh, .NET support for Kubernetes? As I heard, uh, .NET has a lot of investment in this area. They add the support C groups limitation and so and other things to simplify deployment .NET in Kubernetes. Yeah, first first of all, um, I'm, I've I've been doing .NET since the early days, since 2002, 2003, um, and I was happy that .NET should be a platform independent uh, platform, but that wasn't entirely true. So I'm very happy today that with .NET Core and .NET 5 onwards, we can really create platform independent applications. And that gives us a great flexibility. We can deploy them wherever because we can deploy them on Windows, uh, on Linux, uh, other kinds of env environments, different kinds of processor architectures. Uh, so that is already a huge benefit to creating cloud native applications. Yeah, it sounds really good. Uh, let's start talk. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, I've got my presentations, um, my presentation ready. So uh, again, welcome um, to this uh, workshop of building cloud native applications. Um, so indeed, uh, my name is Johnny Hoybergs. Uh, I'm from Belgium, uh, and as uh, as Misha already told you, uh, I'm a consultant, a .NET software developer, and architect for a company called Involved, um, and. Basically, if you need my help after this workshop, you can always contact me on Twitter. Uh, take a look at my GitHub repository. There's lots of information there. Um, and you will also find my professional email address on my uh, PowerPoint slide. So again, if you have any questions, of course, you can ask them during this presentation and during this workshop. Um, if you have any question afterwards, 
don't hesitate to contact me. I am a Microsoft MVP in the category developer technologies, uh, which I have received last year. Very happy with that um, because I also like to contribute to the community. So again, you are the community. If you have questions, just contact me and I, I will do my very best uh, to help you and to answer uh, your questions. Um, so the workshop is actually split into three different parts. Uh, so I've um, I've lined it. I have lined them out here. So there's three parts. Now today we are doing part one. Um, sorry. Uh, today we are doing part one, um, and I will most specifically talk about .NET 5 and all of the uh, opportunities we have in .NET 5 to create cloud-native applications. There's different kinds of uh, templates we can use to create HTTP services, um, long-running background services, gRPC communication services, stuff like that. So I will touch on each of those uh, today. I will talk a little bit about Project Tie. Project Tie is a, is a, is a tool from Microsoft, uh, an open source tool we can use to make our development of different kinds of services that need to work together uh, easier. Because as you all probably know, when you are creating distributed applications or uh, microservices applications, it's very hard to test them on your local environment. You need to spin up all of these different services. They need to work together. So with Project Tie, we can hopefully um, make it a little bit easier um, to also run that locally. I will talk about all the new flexible approaches from .NET 5, which are related to configuration, logging, um, stuff like that. Um, and then finally, I will talk a little bit about cloud services, um, how we can use external cloud services within our cloud native applications like Azure Key Vault, for example, which is able to store secrets and many more. So that will be the introductory part. Then in part two, which will come later today, um, I will talk about containerization and Docker containers. And so we will basically continue our work from part one. So the, the, we are going to create a web API, we are going to create a worker service, and then we are going to put those services inside of a Docker container. We are going to try to run those containers on our local system, configure them so that they can talk to each other. Then we will deploy them to Azure by using Azure Container Registry. So they will be put on top of Azure, and then we can run them inside of Azure manually. And so how do you deploy a service manually in Azure? Um, something that we're not really going to use, but I just want to show you that it's actually quite hard. You need some manual tasks uh, to do that. And then finally, in part three, uh, which will be tomorrow morning, um, we will talk about Azure Kubernetes service. Um, so in Azure Kubernetes service, it will be very easy if you have created cloud native .NET 5 applications, uh, you have put them in uh, Docker images, then you can just pull those images inside of your uh, Kubernetes cluster. You can configure them one time and the Kubernetes cluster will keep itself alive automatically. If you, for example, uh, tell Kubernetes there are three services and they always need to be running and one service goes down, Kubernetes will automatically uh, spin up a new version of your uh, service when it goes down so that your uh, cluster will always be stable. Just to give you an example of how this works, uh, instead of setting up a cluster yourself on your local machine, which would be very hard to do, um, we are going to use Azure. And so on Azure, there is an integrated service called Azure Kubernetes Service, uh, short AKS. Um, and that, will, that one will be very helpful for us to quickly um, create this cluster and also use it. Uh, and that's basically it, so three parts part one, part two, part three, and you should have a basic understanding of containers, Kubernetes, and you can start to play with that uh, by yourself. Um, also, as part of this workshop, I have prepared um, I have prepared a GitHub repository. So if you visit my GitHub page, which is github.com slash Johnny, it's also shared um, on, the, on, the, on the website of .next. Um, you will find a link to my 2021 .next St. Petersburg uh, repository. And this will contain all the information you need for the workshops today and tomorrow. 
Again, there's three parts. Uh, there's part one, part two, and part three. You will find all of the example code scripts for, for Docker, for Kubernetes, inside of this repository. Um, as you can see, I am very late with prepare. So I have prepared for today, part one and part two. And then part three, uh, I have still, still to finalize uh, for tomorrow, but I will do this tonight um, so that we have the, the, the latest information and the latest version so that it, it will work perfectly fine. If you scroll down, there's a README page. This README page shows you my presentation slides, which you can already download, and all the prerequisites. So today and tomorrow, we will use .NET 5, Visual Studio Code, the Azure CLI, Docker Desktop, and Helm. Um, so if you want to follow this workshop until tomorrow, you will need all of these prerequisites. So please um, have these installed. You won't need them right now. For now, you only need .NET 5 and Visual Studio Code. But then for the part two and part three, you will need all of them. So during the break, uh, please make sure that you have installed all of these tools. There's some more information. Um, there's also some extensions inside of Visual Studio Code that we are going to use, uh, YAML, C Sharp, and so forth. And then the workshop is actually split up in different steps. So we will do this step by step, and all of these steps are right here for you to read. And so, for example, step one, we will do that in a couple of minutes. Just click step one, follow all of these steps. There's uh, there's print screens for you to to so that you can can basically follow along. Um, and um, if you want to revisit this workshop tomorrow or the day after or uh, next weekend, you can always look at this repository. It will always be here as long as GitHub is alive. This repository will stay here. Uh, basically. So back to my presentation. Um, also, when there are questions, um, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Please let me know. Uh, you can choose to just watch what I am doing or to follow along on your own computer by typing some code. You can copy paste some code from GitHub if you want. Um, you can ask questions on the chat. Um, and Anna will also help me to answer your questions. So she will notify me when you have questions so that I can immediately answer them. Um, there is a, a delay in the stream. Um, so this is live. I am here right now, but I'm actually here right now with a 20 second delay. Uh, so if you ask me a question, it can take uh, up to a minute until I, I really respond to that. So please uh, keep that in mind. So um, very quickly, a little bit of uh, theoretics. Uh, so when we talk about cloud, cloud native, it has like a definition. And one of the definitions I found online was that cloud native is a collection of microservices that are hosted inside of containers and or serverless apps that can run in multi-cloud environments and are managed by DevOps processes. Um, so yeah, that's a definition. So you can see in blue, I've basically um, noted down the, the bullshit bingo uh, words. Huh? So these are like the fancy words that we like to use. Microservices, what are microservices? Containers, what are containers? Serverless, nothing is really serverless. Everything runs on some kind of server. Um, but a couple of these things we will touch, uh, we will touch on today and tomorrow. Like for example, microservices containers. Uh, we're not going to touch serverless apps um, specifically. Uh, serverless just means that you can use a service on a cloud uh, provider, like for example, um, Azure Key Vault. If you want to store secrets, instead of using file storage, you can just use Azure Key Vault as a serverless service on a cloud environment. Multi-cloud means that you can host your application and it can span multiple clouds. So you can have a, a part of your application run on Azure, another part of your application run on AWS, or just run them on both and, and switch very easily, stuff like that. And then specifically DevOps processes where we have uh, continuous integration, automatic deployment, and all of those processes. We will not really talk about those today because we just don't have the time, unfortunately. Um, First, .NET 5. So .NET 5 uh, released last year is the latest iteration uh, in .NET. Um, you really have to remember that .NET 5 is actually the next iteration of .NET Core. And so the previous version of .NET Core was 3.1, and the last version of .NET Framework was 4. Um, so .NET 5 is just the newest version of .NET, and it is based on um, .NET Core. 
because of this, it is p fully platform independent. So you can use that on different platforms, different processor architectures, very cool. It's high performance. It's a lot more performance than a .NET Framework application. It's very lightweight. When you create a web application in .NET 5 and you spin it up in a web server, it spins up in a matter of like one second. It doesn't take multiple seconds to, to start, which is great. Um, it's future proof. So Microsoft is heading in the future with .NET Core, .NET 5, .NET 6. Um, so when you create applications today you're uh, in .NET 5, you're sure to be future proof. Um, it is cloud native compatible because you can easily integrate that in, into uh, existing cloud environments, uh, into containers. And it's the way to go for your new applications. Um, it's not wrong to still do .NET Framework applications. They can also run in cloud and they can even run in containers if you want. It's just going to be a little bit harder to configure. Um, the, the .NET Core and .NET 5, they are like fully supported out of the box. Um, very, very easy to, to go. But it, Again, if you have existing applications in the .NET framework, you can just keep uh, managing those. You don't have to completely rewrite them. Um, you can do that step by step in the future if you want, um, but no worries there. I told you that it's platform independent, .NET 5. It can run on Windows, Linux, Mac. It can run on different processor architectures like ARM or, uh, or uh, x86 or x64. It can run in the cloud. It can run on IoT devices uh, like a Raspberry Pi, for example. It can run in Docker containers. Whatever you want is possible. Uh, it doesn't run on a potato. Um, it's all, always a joke that people try to make. If it runs on a potato, it runs everywhere. But I tried. .NET 5 does not run on a potato. Um, also, something that I like very much is that .NET 5, the SDK, it's not bound by any tools. It is not tightly linked to Visual Studio. It comes with a, uh, a command line interface, and you can use that command line interface to do everything. You want to create new projects. You want to test your project. You want to build your project, publish your projects, run your projects. It will all work from the command line, so you don't need Visual Studio, which means you can also develop applications inside of a Docker container if you want, because you don't need a user interface or tools to, to actually do everything you need an SDK to do. So it's very powerful um, to use in continuous integration scenarios. Personally, outside of my business hours, so when I'm not working for my company, I like to do personal little things. Um, for example, I wrote a, a small little game that I use for my students. So basically, I didn't talk about this, but in the past, I also teach uh, .NET and C Sharp uh, in school. Um, and instead of creating boring console applications, I, I like my students to create C Sharp applications that they can immediately see an effect. So in this example, students needed to write some C Sharp code um, to make their robot do something, kill another robot, fight with other robots. Um, and this is actually an application that I wrote in .NET 5 or rewrote in .NET 5, the first version was in .NET Framework, but uh, the, the latest version is in .NET 5, and it exists out of multiple services. So this is actually a distrib distributed application because there's multiple parts in this application which all run independently. Um, so in green, you have the front end and the database. They don't really matter for now, but then we have four orange services. We have uh, in the top an HTTP web API. In the middle, we have a, a worker service, which is a processor. This processor actually uh, compiles the C-sharp code dynamically, and it runs the C-sharp code dynamically to make the robots move. And then in the bottom, we have web applications, a web application for the, for the student to write C-sharp code and, and, and uh, commit the C-sharp code to my database so that can actually be processed. And then the validator service to validate C-sharp codes, uh, C-sharp scripts, so that I can see that the students did not make any mistakes, um, which is a gRPC service. So these are, this is a distributed application. I wouldn't really call it a microservice because they all connect to the same database and I'm not going to discuss microservices in detail, but this is a distributed application that should be cloud native. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. Another example from my home is that uh, my wife uh, bought a sauna a couple of years ago. So in my uh, backyard, uh, in my garden, uh, there's like a, a small booth, which is a sauna. It, has a, it had a, a screen, but it was a very old school kind of screen. And when I turn on the sauna, um, I needed to go all the way outside to know if, if it's already on target temperature. Um, so basically, I, I, pulled out, I pulled out the electronic part. I, I looked at it. 
how does it work? Um, and then I just pasted an Android tablet on top of the original interface. I put a Raspberry Pi in, inside of the electronics box and I put a running .NET application on top of the Raspberry Pi and on top of my uh, Android tablet. So now I have, again, a, a, a fully platform independent .NET application. And now I can just take out my phone, um, look at the current temperature, have a nice looking, modern looking tablet tablet inside of the sauna. Now it looks very nice. This is a modern sauna instead of this uh, ugly uh, segmented LCD display. This is also a distributed application. I have a, a gRPC server running on a Raspberry Pi in .NET, which runs, uh, which runs on Linux. Uh, it communicates with my electronics, my temperature sensors, and my electronic switches. I have an HTTP API for my backend, and I have Xamarin frontend, which is very cool. So. As I told you before, microservices is kind of a big thing today. Um, it is a very specific way of creating distributed applications, but I don't really like to use the term microservices. I still like to use the term distributed applications. You don't have one application. No, you, your, your, your uh, software exists out of different smaller services and all of these services, they work together um, to have like a, a common goal. Um, and I really like this uh, this meme, same microservices, one more time. So that's it for theoretics today. We can uh, dive into code um, and see how we can create these kinds of services. So um, step one, create an HTTP web API service. So I told you we are going to use uh, Visual Studio Code. In Visual Studio Code, it's very easy if you have the correct plugins to create uh, .NET applications. Um, if you want to follow along, you can use Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio uh, itself. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, but the first thing I want to show you is uh, a web API. So in Visual Studio Code, you can press uh, Control shift p uh, for your command palette. And then you can type .NET new to create a new .NET application. We are going to pick the template um, ba -ba -ba -bum, ASP.NET, so let me just search for ASP.NET Web API. I select ASP.NET Web API. Then I need to select a folder. So let's say um, this is going to be my Web API folder that will contain my project. And then I will name my project Web API. Just, I'm just going to keep things simple, a simple name, Web API. The project will now automatically be created in Visual Studio Code. Again, you can do the same thing from Visual Studio. And when it's ready, I can open it from here. And I can start with this. So. Um, the thing that I really like about .NET Core and .NET 5 and all the future .NETs is that basically most of the applications that we create are just console applications. And before in, in, in .NET Framework, if you created an ASP.NET application, it was very specific to ASP.NET. You, you, you always needed to run that inside of a web server. It could be IIS or IIS Express or some other kind of web server, but in .NET Core, Almost everything is a console application. So you can also see that in Web API when you open the program.cs. It's just like a regular console application. It has a main method, but inside of the main method, it runs a synchronous function called create host builder. And create host builder is a blocking function that actually um, uses a couple of lines of code to um, configure a web application. And this web application by default will run using an internal web server from .NET itself. So .NET, the runtime from .NET, has its built-in web server called Kestrel. It's a very lightweight, very simple web server that can easily uh, run your web applications. So if I open a terminal window, and I just do .NET run, it will run my console application inside of this terminal after it, it it will build and now it runs it on localhost port 5000 so if i visit this link and uh, this is my web application and it's fully running it's it's very very easy very lightweight again so what i want to do with you uh, today is i want to build 
a couple of these services, very simple services, um, to, I'm sorry, I'm just juggling with my screens, um, to, to show you how different services can communicate to each other and how we can use Project Thai to make our lives a little bit easier. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to change my controller. So it's by default, it's a weather forecast controller. So I want to rename this into a status controller. I don't want to have weather forecasting. I just want to have status. So I'm going to rename my controller into status control. I'm going to remove some of the existing code. Which give me a little bit more of my screen. I have my logger, which is totally fine. And I have a I have a get method. And I'm going to change this get method to return a string. Inside of my get method, I'm going to return environment dot she name. So this will come in handy when we're doing Docker containers and Azure Kubernetes services, because then I can see the machine name of the of the container that my application is actually running. So we're just going to reuse these kinds of uh, things for the next uh, days. So get returns environment dot machine name. So that's very very easy. So uh, again, to recap, status controller. It has a get method, an HTTP get method, and it returns my current machine name. So if I run my application one more time, I visit my link like that, and I just do slash status, it will return my machine name, which is desktop um, OTC, whatever, doesn't really matter. That's the name of my computer that I'm running up. It's, it's funny that it says desktop because it's actually a laptop, but <laughs> I don't really care for now. So very easy. Um, a cool thing that I, that I, uh, that I find about um, .NET Core is that it has integrated dependency injection. So you can see right here that it actually has a, a, a private member called iLogger. And iLogger is uh, uh, an abstract definition of something that does logging inside of my .NET Core application. So I can just use this. And I can use this by putting it inside of my constructor, which is called uh, dependency injection using the constructor, so constructor injection. And uh, .NET and ASP.NET will automatically give me an instance of an iLogger. I don't care what kind of logger um, I'm going to use. I just want some kind of logger. So I'm just going to use the abstract definition of a logger. And then inside of my get method, I can do something like logger.log, .log, uh, log information, let's say. I'm going to log um, the environment machine name also as an informational message. I was using dependency injection already for a long time, but I was always using external frameworks because in .NET Framework, this was not available as a default part of .NET Framework. And so I needed to use like Unity or Ninject or Structure Map, which are external uh, packages that do the same thing. But today it's really integrated into .NET Core and .NET 5. So if I run this, if I try to run this again, run. Open the link, visit my status endpoint, it returns, very good. And if I look now at my um, at my console application, because this terminal again, is it's just running a console application and inside of this console application is the Kestrel web server running my uh, web API, running my HTTP API. And you can see that there's an informational message here from the status controller. This is actually why this generic type is here. This generic type is just like a category or a description of my logger, which is uh, basically this, this piece of the message. And then the next piece of the message is just the machine name that is being logged to my console. So very cool. So this is already a service that is working. This is a working service. I can run it very easily. And you can also see that inside of um, Visual Studio Code, you can just use the terminal .NET run and it runs very quickly. 
very cool. So the next part, and I'm going to open a second, um, second Visual Studio code for this. This is my second Visual Studio code. I'm going to create a new .NET application. So again, .NET new. I'm going to search another template, which is called a worker service. This is a kind of service that I really, really like. Let's go again to my source, repos, .next. Now I'm creating a second project, which is called worker service. I'm going to name it worker service. Give it a little bit of time to create. Look at the code. And again, it looks like a console application that is very similar to the one that I've created before for my web API. Again, I've got a host builder, but this time I'm not creating a web application, I'm creating a worker service. And what is a worker service? You can actually, if you're, if you're into the Windows world, it, you can compare it to a Windows service. And so a Windows services, if you open your services in Windows, um, like this little screen, containing all of your long running services that basically run in the background of your computer. Um, this is what a worker service can do for you. In .NET Framework, this already existed as a Windows service because .NET Framework was very specific to Windows. They had a template called Windows Service to create these kinds of services. In .NET Core, it doesn't really make sense to have a template for a Windows service because a Windows service cannot run on a Linux environment. So that's why we today we have a worker service. And a worker service is like a more abstract concept of a long-running background service. And again, it's a console application, which already it's very cool to me because a Windows service, you cannot run that as a console. So if you try to debug and to test a Windows service, you need to first install it as a Windows service, then you need to run it, then you need to attach your debugger to it, which is a lot of work just to, to uh, get everything working. With a, a worker service in .NET Core, you can just run it like a console application. So let me first show you. Um, it has like one line of code that says add hosted service, which is a class. So if I go to the... Um, implementation of this class, it runs a continuous while loop uh, until the end of time that just logs this line of code every one second. So if I do view terminal, again, .NET run, it will build, it will start this service as a console application. And now you can see that every second it will log the time for me. Again, it's using the logger. Um, it's just every second it logs one line and it runs as a console application. So if I'm developing this application, I can just immediately run it from Visual Studio Code or from Visual Studio, and I can immediately see um, what it's doing. If I want to really install this as a Windows service, I can just install one NuGet package, add one line of code here. There's going to be one additional line of code here. Um, I'm not going to show you right now. You can find it using using Google, but it's like um, use Windows services or something like that. Uh, and then it will be compatible with a Windows service and you can install it like a Windows service in the exact same way as you would install like an old school .NET framework uh, Windows service. So very easy to do that. If you want to run this as a, as a, as a service on Linux, it's the same story. You need another NuGet package to run it on Linux as a service, and you do something like use systemd. Systemd is the, um, is the Linux uh, variant of what a Windows service is. So uh, systemd is a tool on Linux that makes it possible to run services in the background. Um, and this is actually exactly what I'm doing in my uh, Sauna application. So in my Sauna application, I have created a worker service that runs on the Raspberry Pi that, that can communicate with the electronics. And this basically is a, is a while loop that continuously looks at the temperature sensor. So like every, I don't know, 10 seconds or something, it reads from the temperature sensor. And if the temperature sensor tells the worker service that uh, the target temperature has not been reached, it keeps the electronic switch on. And then when it reaches the target temperature, it just switches the electronic switch off, and then the, the, the heating inside of the sauna will be off. And that's it. It's a very simple worker service, but I can install it on my Raspberry Pi as a, as a system D service. And because it runs as a system D service, when I just unplug my Raspberry Pi from the power, 
and I plug it back in, it will automatically boot Linux and it will automatically start all of the services again. So I don't, I don't have to do anything. Just if it crashes for some reason, which happens like once every couple of months, then it, for some reason it doesn't work. I just pull it out of the power, push it back in, wait for half a minute, and then it runs perfectly fine again. I don't have to do SSH or I don't have to uh, attach a screen to it. It will automatically work, which is very powerful. So what I want to do today is I want to change this worker. And instead of just logging um, this random line of code, I want it to call um, my web API. And I want to make it write uh, the response from the web API right here. So that's what we are going to do. So first of all, um, we are going to use an external package, an external NuGet package that I like to use for calling a web API. And so this is basically a client, a client application. Um, sorry, I'm just cheating a little bit. I don't know everything by heart, so I'm just copy pasting here. <laughs> um, I'm using REST Sharp, which is a, a, a tool that helps you call um, REST APIs or HTTP APIs, uh, which makes my life a little bit easier. So REST Sharp. When I go back to my worker, I can now use REST Sharp to create a client. So let's see. I can do something like var um, rest client equals new rest client client. Um, and then the location will be a uh, local host. So the web API can run on my local system on port 5000. I need to do an additional using here. So using rest sharp. So my second line of code will be a REST uh, request. So I'm doing a request, new REST request status. This is the endpoint name. And so the, the full URL for my uh, status endpoint will be localhost port 5000 slash status. And the kind of HTTP methods that I'm using is a get method. So I'm doing an HTTP get on this endpoint. Then I can have a response, it uses my client. It will execute asynchronously um, something that returns a string, and it will use my request to do that. And then instead of um, printing the current time, oops, I'm going to print whatever response I got from my web API. So now, uh, let's see, response should be response dot uh, data. So response is basically an object that is uh, um, a wrapper around your response. So it also contains information about your HTTP status codes and stuff like that. Uh, so inside of this response is data and that's your actual body of your HTTP response. So I'm going to print this to my logger. So that's it. Um, if I run this, it will not work because my web API is not running. So if I do .NET run, let's see, let's see what happens. Probably is going to throw an exception or it's going to print nothing. Okay, it prints null. And so there is no response because my web API is not running. Um, so if I go back to my other Visual Studio code, let's see. Uh, this one, this is my web API, and I also run this, .NET run. Yes, now it's running. And I go back to my worker. You can see that now my worker is not telling uh, the logger null, but it's telling desktop uh, and so on. So it, now there's communication between those two services. So basically, we have now created a distributed application. There's two components to this application, uh, a web API backend and a worker service uh, backend. So they are talking to each other. OK, that's very cool. So let's see what uh, we can do in part three. 
So now that I have these two components, let, let's uh, stop them both. I want to introduce to I want to introduce you to something that is called Project Tie. So Project Tie is actually a tool from Microsoft that can help you to run these applications at the same time without you having to struggle with different Visual Studio codes or Visual Studios and uh, running them all manually one by one and also configuring them. And because as you can see now, I hard coded this URL um, for my local environment. But if you want to deploy this to an actual environment, you need to change this. So it needs to be a configurable value. But then what, what, what are you going to do? Always manually change your configuration. So Project Tie can really uh, help you with that. So let me find my GitHub repository. So in um, step three, which is where we're at right now, it has some information on how you can install Project Tie. So if you open uh, console and you just run this, um, it will install Project Tie as a, a console tool in .NET. And so .NET has NuGet packages. Uh, a NuGet package cannot only be an extension to your project, but a NuGet package can also be a self-sufficient tool. It can be a tool that you can use as a developer, so a development tool. So Project Tie is this kind of development tool. So by calling .NET tool install Microsoft Tie, I'm installing Microsoft Tie as a tool. So if I do Tie, uh, I'm not sure of the syntax, like Tile Tie info, um, then you can see you can see that it's installed. Um, it's uh, on my system. It's all, of course already installed, so that's that's cool. Um, but now I can I can use this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, an additional file. So let me go to my um, go to my Windows Explorer. So let me find my repositories. So Johnny source repos.next. So this this um, this folder contains both my web API and my worker service. So I've created both of these uh, inside of Visual Studio Code. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open this folder inside of um, Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to right click .next open with code. And now I have a .NET code that, that has these two um, folders inside of it. So I have, basically, I have access to both of these projects. And I'm going to add one little file um, inside of this root folder. And I'm going to call it pi.yaml. pi.yaml is a configuration file that you can create to configure Ty to run your application uh, in one run. So let me show you if I just do a little bit of copy pasting. So your entire distributed application can have a name. And so I have my cloud native application. I'm not going to call it Web API because it's more than that. So it's it's my cloud native application. That's the name of, of my uh, combined services. And then I'm going to describe that my uh, cloud native application exists out of two separate services, a Web API and a worker service. And those projects are located here. So there's a subfolder called Web API, and it contains a Web API.cs project file, and then there's a worker service which contains a separate worker service.cs project file. So this tells Project Tie, look, there are two services, um, and you need to run them as one. And the cool thing about this is if if you now open a terminal within that folder, so if I do like a, a directory. Information you can see that I have my two folders, Web API and Worker Service, and I have my tie.yaml file. And now I, instead of doing .NET run, I'm doing tie run. And tie run will look at the tie.yaml file and it will run all of the services you have configured within that. So it will load the application details and it will start all of these applications at the same time. And the cool thing is, it also hosts a dashboard. So now there's a dashboard on localhost port 8000, if you open that one. Um, let me repeat that, dear computer, if you open that one. There we go. 
now it's open three uh, three times. Um, it lists all of the services within your project. And so you can see that there's a web API and there's a worker service. You can also see that it automatically configures a random port for your web API. So my web API is now not running on port 5000, it's running on port 6713 or 6712, HTTP or HTTPS. Um, you can just visit this link and then put the slash status in the end and you can see that it works. So this is now running my web API. But you can see um, that the worker service does not have a binding because it's not a web application, it's a console application. But the console application has some logging, so I can view my log from this service, and I can see that it returns null for uh, each second, because of course, it cannot connect to my uh, web API because the port has changed, and I have hard-coded it to port 5000. So now, we really need to configure Project Ty dynamically to be able to automatically load our services. So if I go inside of my um, web API, no, not my web API, my worker service, I'm going to need an additional NuGet package. And this NuGet package gives me an opportunity to talk to Project I. So this NuGet package is called microsoft.ty.extensions.configuration. So this has some extension methods for configuration that allow me to communicate with Project I. So if I go to my worker, instead of hard coding this REST um, client, I'm actually going to um, use a configuration. And just like before, I told you there is like an abstract concept of a logger in .NET Core. You also have an abstract abstract concept of a configuration. So there's I config configuration configuration like this and you can add that as a private field yeah I'm a I'm a I'm a copy paste developer and I need to do some using like that using uh, Microsoft extensions configuration. So now I have access to my configuration data. Um, configuration data basically contains whatever is inside of app settings or JSON, um, but it can, it can be more than that. It can be environment variables, or if you want your configuration to come from Azure Key Vault, for example, you can just use uh, the same thing. Again, it's, it's, it's what I like about .NET Core. Everything is extensible. I, as a developer, within this class, I don't really care where the configuration comes from. It's somewhere in the abstract concept of configuration. And I only need to configure um, where it needs to come from inside of this class. And so if my code is clean, um, I can just use iConfiguration and it should work. So instead of hard coding it right here, I can do configuration dot get service URI. Service URI is an extension method from Ty. So this will automatically be pre-filled with whatever kind of service that I need. So basically, the only thing I need to do is get the name of the service. So if I open my tie.yaml, the name of the service is Web API. So tie knows that Web API is the name of the service, and it will um, randomly assign a port to the Web API. And if we ask for a service URI, it will be like this, get service URI web API. And now I have the correct um, service endpoint. So let's go back to my terminal. Where is it? Yeah, it's this one. Sorry. So again, this is my Visual Studio code that has the parent folder open. The parent folder contains my tie.yaml. And just like before, um, sorry, just like before, I'm going to do Thai run. It's going to start the applications on a random port. I can use my dashboard from Thai to look at what the actual port is. So now it's 914 or 915. And if I look at this uh, log, it seems that it crashed. So I've been a bad boy. Let me quickly check what I did wrong. Um, oh. Okay, 
something was already running in the background. Let's try that again. Oh, it's not able to build my project. Okay. Just let's make sure that all the other um, .NETs are killed. Also, um, okay, let's try it one more time. Of course, when you have multiple um, .NET runs running your application, it cannot compile, so you need to stop everything, make sure. Yeah, now it works. So now it's it has built and it has started my two services. I can open the dashboard. And not four times. And if I look at my worker service, you can see that now it works. So Project Tie automatically injected the correct endpoint URL to my uh, other services because they are asking it uh, from code. All right. So I think Project Tie is very powerful um, because when you have very complex distributed application that, that, that run like five, six, 10, 20 different services, and you really want to do some integration testing on your local environment. Um, you just have to create one YAML file, titled YAML file, um, uh, configure it, and then do tie run, and it will run all of your services at, at the same time. It will inject all of the endpoint URLs to all of your services, so they just work. Of course, that can be, um, some kind of an issue. So uh, I have my next step, which is step four. Um, if you have custom configuration, because of course, now we are really tied to tie, tied to tie. <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird sentence, because of course we have hard coded um, the dependency on project tie inside of the worker. And the get service URI, it's, it's really specifically to tie. So I, for myself, um, I really like to put an, uh, a layer of ab abstraction in between. So I really like to put um, a part of my configuration in app settings or JSON. So when I'm, for example, uh, I want to deploy this and there is there is like an, uh, an app setting that has the, the correct URL and I want to set that using uh, Azure pipelines um, to the correct value, that's perfectly fine. But I, I also want to run it uh, with Project Tie on my local environment. So I need to find some way to make those two different kind of approaches work together. Um, let's see how I am on time. Still have some time left, so I can I can do this. So what I'm basically basically going to do is inside of my worker service, so I'm going to select my worker service folder. I'm going to add a new file called myconfiguration.cs. And this um, myconfiguration.cs will contain um, a class called myconfiguration. I'm going to, because I, 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 like, I like to do it like that, I'm going to create an interface also, I myconfiguration. And it's going to have a value, a parameter, a value, a configuration value, um, basically. Let me quickly do some cheating. Called Web API Service URL. So uh, string Web API Service URL, and I it has a setter. My actual class that implements from this interface will also have the same thing, and it will have a constructor that will set these values, and it will set them from I configuration. So I'm going to use an, the actual I configuration. Uh, work with me here like this. And now I can do something like, um, okay, I'm going to get the web API service URI from um, I will explain why I'm doing this a little bit later. 
Um, so from configuration, so from this configuration, I'm just going to do the same thing as before, get service URI. So this is project type. I want a project tie URL for the web API, and I'm going to store it within this value uh, variable. If that value is empty, it means that I'm not using project I. I'm going to try again and get this value from the actual configuration dot get value of string with the key, which is basically the same the same name of my property inside of this class. So I can use name of, so I don't need to use magic strings. I'm sorry, like that. And in the end, I can set this property to that value. So now I have like my, my own little configuration thing in between. It will first try to get it from project I, and if it can't find it from project I, it will get it from my actual um, app settings of JSON, for example. So this means that in my app settings of JSON, I can add parameter that contains my host URI if I want to run this without project I. Also, when, when I'm uh, deploying this using uh, a continuous integration pipeline, for example, you can have uh, a different kind of app settings that has your production values, your uh, acceptance environment values, or your test environment values, or you can have some placeholder here that gets replaced by the pipeline automatically, basically whatever you want. Um, now I have the opportunity to use project I or use um, this value. So. Of course, in my worker, I need to need to make some changes. So in my worker, I'm going to use my configuration instead of I configuration. And in this, I can actually get rid of the get service URI and just use the property. Also, something that I like very much is that dependency injection concept. So I'm just asking my worker class, give me an instance of I my configuration, and I should automatically get that instance of my configuration. But of course, you need to do some, um, some uh, work for that. So inside of your program.cs, you need to do add um, singleton, for example. My configuration can be a singleton object, and I'm going to link I my configuration to my configuration like that. Now, dependency injection knows that if I'm asking for I my configuration, that it needs to return to me an instance of my configuration and it needs to be a singleton. So when I ask it multiple times, I will always get the same uh, instance. So um, let's see if I'm. Yeah, if I run this locally, so let's first try to do that. If I run this locally, it means if I go to my other Visual Studio codes, so this is the web API. This is only the web API. So I'm going to do .NET run. And it's running. Then I'm going to go to my separate worker service, which is this one. It reads from my configuration, so .NET run. It should, if I didn't make any mistakes, it should return to me the correct machine name. It does, because now it's actually reading this value from my app settings, which is correct. Perfect. So let's shut these services down again. Go back to, so that's my worker service. This is not the correct one. I'm trying to find my web API. There's too many Visual Studio codes open. There he is. Shut, shut it down. Go back to, this is the full blown one. So this is uh, my two services and my tie file. So if I now do tie run, doesn't really look good. So I run, starting the application, running it on this URL. Now the port is uh, 61950. And if I look at this, you can see that it also works. So this is 
everything that I needed to do to make sure that I have different options of running my application. Uh, if I want to run it in a test environment, um, I can configure it using continuous integration and app settings or JSON. Um, but if I want to use Ty on my local system, it also works um, because it's using the get service URI. So this is something that I actually use um, both on my personal uh, projects and on my professional projects. And so right now I'm, for example, working for uh, Deloitte uh, in Belgium. And uh, there's, it's, it's a huge application that runs um, multiple web APIs and dozens of different worker services. Um, sometimes it's just handy to just run everything on your local environment to, to very quickly uh, check some things. And we configured Project Tie to, to be able to do that. And the only thing you need to do is just open your terminal, tie run on your YAML file. Everything spins up automatically. Um, and you can immediately do some debugging. Um, because basically all of your services are running now. So if you use Visual Studio, you can attach to an existing process to debug your code um, that is running using Project Tie. And I really like this user interface. You can imme immediately see all of your services that are running. If it's a web service, you can just click this link to visit um, the actual web uh, page if, if that is um, if that is needed. But you can also see the logging. So you can see like the console logging by just clicking uh, view, which I think is, is very powerful. And here you can see that it uh, it looks from my controller. And here you can see that it looks from my worker. Very cool. So what's next? So there aren't any questions, Anna? I can hear you, yes. Oh, thank you. Well, we during all this talk, we had one question. Uh, the guy asked uh, whether we are going to cover CI/CD process or not. But yeah, already answered this question. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I really, I really like to do stuff like that, um, but we don't have the time. Um, so no, I'm not going to cover CI/CD. I can you. I can, however, um, later when we when we have the discussion zone, I can show you some things from my from my local projects, for example. I like this, the sauna application. The sauna application is entirely covered by, by CI CD. So when I make a change on my GitHub page, it will automatically be built. The unit tests will be run. There will be code coverage um, reports from that. And I have uh, a, a custom um, agent running on my in my local home that will actually build the application. It will deploy it uh, immediately to my Raspberry Pi. So I don't have to do anything manually. Just make a change to my GitHub repository and everything will be done automatically um, up until my Raspberry Pi getting a new version, being restarted, and it will just work out of the box. So very powerful stuff. Yeah, I guess I guess you discussed uh, this topic and maybe several uh, at, at some conference as far as I remember. Yes, exactly, indeed. So, so, okay, now so let's, we don't have yeah. any any questions to chat. Maybe we give our audience some time to 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 think about questions, and we we'll, we can start from questions if they occur uh, yes. from the next part. Maybe we just continue right now. Yes, perfect, good idea. Um, I'm, I, I will not have the time to show you a gRPC service. Um, I mean, type type to type the code for you. So I'm just going to show you the immediate solution that I already prepared. So again, if you look at my repository um, on GitHub, everything is there. Um, so you can use that for whatever things you want. Um, so if let's see, yep, this one, so step five contains a gRPC service. So this is also a technology that I very much like. Um, if you already have some history with WCF, it is somewhat similar. An HTTP API is very specific. An HTTP API um, uses like resource endpoints and HTTP methods to do stuff on those resources. Yeah? You can get resources, you can post resources, you can put resources, you can delete resources. Um, but sometimes when we want to have communication outside of different processes, we want you want to have different processes communicate to each other, but not using this REST concept. You really want to call a method inside of another process, which is something that we could do in the past by using SOAP Web Services or WCF, which is just a SOAP Web Services uh, it, uh, at the end. But 
in .NET Core, WCF is not supported. So you can't create a WCF service in .NET Core or .NET 5. Um, why? Because there are more modern technologies to do the same thing. Uh, WCF service is what we call a remote procedure call service. We basically call a method on a remote process. Um, um, what WCF will do based on the channel, you can change the kind of channel, but by default, it will use XML SOAP. And so it will use XML envelopes, XML messages that will describe what method we need to call on the, on the, on the server side. And then the server side will translate this XML into, okay, which method do I need to call in this code and what data should I return? And these are just HTTP um, calls using XML. Uh, Web API, for example, can also use XML, but by default, we today we use uh, JSON because it's a little bit uh, smaller in size. Now, gRPC is something a little bit different. It also uses the concept of remote procedure calls, um, but the protocol of communication is, um, is a little bit different. It also uses HTTP, but it uses HTTP2. Um, and the communication format is binary. So it will not send XML, it will not send JSON, it will send a binary stream of data um, that are just ones and zeros, basically. Um, the downside to that is that it's harder to debug, so you, you can't just use your browser to check your endpoints because that will not work. A browser is not able to communicate with HTTP2, um, and the binary data would not really make sense. You will just see a bunch of binary data, and you don't really see the data you are sending. Um, so how does it work? It can create a client and a server based on a definition. And this definition file is called a proto buff definition. So proto is a, is a kind of, it's not a really a language, it's a description language. And so you describe your um, service, your service methods and your service data. Um, you can actually compare it to a, a WSDL file from, from WCF or SOAP services. Uh, in SOAP services, you also have a WSDL file or a WSDL file um, that describes your service in XML. This proto file is basically the same thing. And so you say there's a C-sharp namespace because we are working with C-sharp. So um, I will talk to you about this a little bit later. Um, and then there's a service, which is kind of a class that is called status. And inside of this service is a method, a rem remote procedure that is called get status. And that get stat status has a parameter called request, and it returns a response. And the request and the response are objects. And these objects can be described below as like a... Uh, uh, a class or a struct or whatever. It's not really a C-sharp thing, it's a proto thing. Um, the request doesn't need any data, so it's just an empty request, but the response contains one property called message. Um, actually, because it's a binary format, the only thing you need to do is decide on an order. And that's the number that you can see in the end. Excuse me. So equals one actually means that this is the first field. If you want to have multiple fields, you just need to number them. So it's not the order in which you did declare them, it's the, it's the numbers that you put in the end. And the reason we need an order is because it's a binary format. So it will just be a binary stream of zeros and one. Um, and uh, gRPC will know, okay, if the message is the first part, then it will be this part of the binary stream. And if name is the second part, it will be that part of the binary stream. So that will be used for serialization and deserialization. So in .NET Core, when you create this kind of uh, proto file, inside of your project file for C Sharp, you actually use a NuGet package called gRPC ASP.NET Core. And you define that proto file as a proto buff file. So it's not just a source file, no, it's a proto buff source file. And you need to specify if you want to use it for server side code or client side code. Why? Just like with WCF, gRPC will automatically generate code for you. It will generate the server code for you or the client code, depending on which kind of project you're creating. And so in this case, um, this is my gRPC service. Again, um, .NET Core, if I look at the program, it's again, it's a console application with a host builder. This again is a web host, but it hosts um, not a web API, but a gRPC service. And if I look at this startup class, 
you can see that it maps a gRPC service as an endpoint. And so it, it uses custom endpoints to, to be compatible with gRPC. And that service endpoint is called status service. So if we go, if we go to that implementation, <clears throat> okay, if, if I go manually to that implementation, you can see that it's a class that derives from status.status .status base. And this status base is actually the end, the, the, the automatically generated code for the server side. And then the only thing you need to do is to override your RPC, your, um, your remote procedure, and then just put some code inside. You, you will get a request and you need to return a response. These classes, you don't need to make them by yourself. This code is generated, so you can just use them. And it's going to be the same thing for your client. So if I look at my worker service, which is going to be my client, so the worker service is the same one from before, but it not only calls the web API, it will also call the gRPC service. If I look at the project file, it also has this protobuf, but now it's not for server side, it's for client side, and this will generate client side code. So if I look at my gRPC client code, you have stuff like gRPC channels, and clients. So gRPC channel is to set up a communication channel with an endpoint. So it's the same thing as what we do with REST Sharp. We just have an, uh, an HTTP URI. We create a channel. And then we this class, status client, automatically exists. Um, it's being auto-generated. We can just use that. And we need, to, we need to pass the channel. And then we can just call the remote procedure like we would do in C Sharp. So it's just like calling a method on top of a class in C Sharp, but in the background, it's going to call um, a web service, which is very cool. I really like this concept. Um, and just to, to, to finalize this, this concept, um, I, I like gRPC for internal service to service communication. So when I have multiple services that need to talk to each other, I really like. Um, I really like this. Uh, and if I want to uh, have communication with the outside world, I like to use Web API. So I think that's it. That's everything that I wanted to talk about uh, for this first uh, part. Yeah, thank you, Johnny. We are continue its talk uh, later. And now we are switching to partner blog.